Welcome everyone and welcome to another episode of the Business Hour here with Umar Rashid on Unity FM and hope you're doing well, hope you're good. This is the show where we talk about all things business or so whether you are a business owner, an entrepreneur, um, someone thinking to go into business or even an employee then we've got you covered because through our fantastic guests we talk about all things business related. Now before I go on to introduce today's guests if you've missed the previous shows then do not worry you can listen to them on the unity fm website or alternatively you can visit my youtube channel at umar rashid hr and all the previous episodes are on there you can also connect with me on all social media platforms such as uh, linkedin twitter facebook instagram and the handles for all of those are at umar rashid hr now today today's guest is someone who is absolutely 100% truly truly inspiring um, I heard her speak at a networking event a couple of years ago um, and I was actually taken aback with one she's actually a really really funny person she actually does crack me up um, <laughs> but the journey the inspiration um, everything about it was actually truly truly uh, inspirational so for me it is actually a great honor that I have got uh, this lovely lady on today so no further ado introducing her so she is a multi award winning inclusion specialist and a social entrepreneur listed as one of the UK's most influential disabled people by the Shores Trust and the BBC's 100 women in 2020 she created Diversability which is the world's first inclusive platform for disabled people uh, and it's aimed at reducing the financial pressures from unavoidable extra costs of living with a health condition or impairment. She created the Asian Women Festival uh, which is the world's first of its kind annual festival empowering South Asian women and underrepresented genders to be activists, stereotypes and um, sorry to be activists of their own future. Um, she also creates the Asian Disability Network, which is an educational platform for people who experience multiple types of stigma due to their ethnic and cultural identities. She's won numerous honours and awards. Um, she's been Campaigner of the Year in November 2021 at the European Diversity Awards. She was named one of 35 under 35. Uh, last summer by Business Live. She was voted most influential woman in leadership for 2021 uh, in CEO magazine. She has won the Outstanding Contribution to Communities Award in 20, um, December 2020 for investing in ethnicity. The BBC in 2020 November had her listed as one in the 100 women's list as well. And she's also won Future Face um, Future Faces Awards as part of the Greater Birmingham Chamber um, in 2020. And the most impressive thing, which we will talk about, is that she's also had a cameo experience um, in EastEnders as well. Ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, we have Shani Danda on today. Shani, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, you. I've had to kind of cut down your bio because... It is quite amazing and it's quite inspirational. Um, so well done. It's Thank amazing. Um, I know I've been inspired by yourself. Um, and one of the biggest inspirations I'm going to take personally from you is, yes, you have a physical disability. My son also has a physical disability. Mm. Um, and I look at, you know, actually we shouldn't be so restrictive. We mm. shouldn't just think actually people with a disability that's it they should be at a certain level yeah actually if you push and you give them that encouragement um you know and through the grace of god as well yeah. we don't know the levels that they can achieve so thank you for being a slight inspiration for me as well thank you thank how you. are you anyway i'm good i'm good i'm really happy to be back in birmingham yeah just catching up with everybody and it's a real honor to be here on your show thank you thank you a lot of people say that as well <laughs> <laughs> um it's you say you're back in birmingham mm. and, and that's because very recently you was in dubai wasn't you whilst we were 
freezing ourselves off in December. Yeah. You was in nice sunny Dubai. <laughs> what was you doing over there? Uh, so I was invited to go and speak at Dubai Expo, all around entrepreneurship. Nice. So uh, yeah, it was for the UK Pavilion. So yeah, it was a really nice moment to represent the UK on the world stage, such as the Expo. Uh, and then obviously, you know, I combined a bit of a holiday into of course, it as well. So, you know, yeah. Once in the, you know, once you're in Dubai. I mean, yeah. yeah. Do you see yourself possibly one day living internationally or 100%. abroad? 100%. Yeah, <laughs> you do. Okay. Um, I, I, um, I really don't like the cold weather. Like, there's so many great pros to living in the UK, obviously. Um, but for me, I've, I've said it from a really young age, I could just want to live in a warmer country. It helps my health as well because... My bones really hurt in the cold weather. I sound like an old woman now, but yeah, uh, absolutely. And she's not an old woman because, like I said, she was one of the 35 under 35 uh, to to look out for. Any particular country you're thinking of, you've got your eyes on, that you would want to Yeah, I, to go to? I definitely want to spend some time in LA. Okay. Uh, but I would definitely also love to spend some time in Dubai. I was thinking like maybe spend the winter months there and then you know come back here for the summer but I'm not at that level yet so we'll see we'll see where life takes me that's wicked that's <laughs> wicked you mentioned a little bit just there about your health and your bones yeah. um just for our audience mm. if you just want to share the the condition that you do have yeah so I was born with a really rare genetic condition it's called osteogenesis imperfecta but it's more commonly known as brittle bone disease um, it's so rare that it uh, there's only around like one in fifteen thousand people that will ever have it. Um, so what what the characteristics of the condition are is that your bones are very fragile and very weak. It, it's essentially like being made out of glass, and your bones just break without any trauma, without any injury. Um, and by the age of 14, I had broken my legs six times. Wow. And I know that sounds like a lot, but people with my condition can actually break up to three to 400 times throughout their life. So the fact I've only broken six times, you know, I consider myself to be extremely lucky. And then I really benefited from um, medical treatments like rodding in my legs, surgeries, um, treatments to, to strengthen my bone density. But the most noticeable thing about me is that I have a short stature. So I'm three foot ten in height, and uh, that's about the height of a four year old. So yeah, that that's that's what people notice about me first. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I mean that's amazing. Like, so when you said you've broken your leg six times, mm. would that could it just be simply just just walking and, and yeah. that's it? The bones have gone. The most bizarre break I had was. Um, I was 11 years old we were on a family holiday in Canada it was the last day of our holiday and you know how you pick a child up from under the arms Yeah. my auntie just picked me up and my leg broke no way. my leg wasn't in any pain or anything like that I don't know why it, but that, that that was just the condition it's it's just so unpredictable to live with um, so that was the most bizarre experience and then my mum drugged me up and flew me back to the to England and brought me here to Sandra Hospital because it was our local hospital so yeah um I've got I could write a book with all the stories <laughs> and you know what that'd be one of the books I'd want to I would I would yeah. definitely read so when your condition was it mm. just something once you were born that's when your parents knew it wasn't sort of like I'm, I'm thinking technology wise yeah. but it wasn't picked up at scans or anything like no, that at that time no it wasn't and <clears throat> I, I did mention you know it, it is a genetic condition but it doesn't run in my family yeah so i'm what they call a spontaneous mutation and apparently the consultant sort of said to my parents of like a one in million chance that that can happen so it's kind of cool being a spontaneous mutation, but no, it doesn't run in my family. But then if I went to go on and have children, then there's about a 50% chance that I could pass it on yeah. um, that way. So, yeah. How's, um, how's life treated you growing up with, with your condition? Because obviously you mentioned about, um, you know, in the bio, I mentioned about, you know, you started a div um, the, the card, the yeah. financial pack. And I remember when you first... When I first heard you speak, yeah. that was one of the first things you spoke about. And it obviously caught my eye as mm. well, you know, having a, a son with, with a disability as yeah. well. So 
what triggered you to was it through your old life experiences did Absolutely, that trigger you yeah. wanting to do that yeah so i was you know brought up in a punjabi sikh family in a big community um and grow a group in a very loving and supporting family you know and i wouldn't be where i am without all of that today but i was continually faced with low expectations within my family but within the wider community as well um i actually went to a special needs primary school because that's what inclusion was over 30 years ago i loved it don't get me wrong i used to play all day but i also remember the teachers telling me like you've read all the books in the school like I don't think that was the best place for my learning but at the time that was the only place where I could go to school where my physical needs could be met then I went to a mainstream secondary school so suddenly I was in a massive you know school with hundreds of children it was a real cultural shock for me but I think when I got to secondary school I just sort of realized I don't really know the basics here in education because not only was the education different in a special needs school but then because of all the breaks i missed loads of schools as well mm. and despite you know my mom giving me extra homework from school creating her own version of homework and going to the school hospital um it doesn't it doesn't beat you know that kind of that education you get in school um so yeah i i, I would say i've always ha- i felt like i've always had to play catch up um in terms of education i would never call myself academic and that's why you, when people ask me what's my most proudest achievement I could reel so many things off but it's actually graduating from uni because I never thought I'd go and then I did and then I graduated and it's it's one of my biggest personal achievements. What did you graduate? Um, I <laughs> did my degree in event and venue management okay. and then I went on to be an event manager for 10 years and some of my clients included some very famous people like Anthony Joshua, Tyson Fury. And what I really loved in that job is because I'm three foot ten, I have to think outside of the box every single day. Like I have to figure out how to reach my kitchen cupboards, how I'm going to drive, you know, how am I going to get clothes to fit me that I want to wear. So I was really good at problem solving and that's what event management is all about. You know, Mm. it's about planning, being methodical, knowing what to do in a crisis. Um, And I I just love the fact that I could challenge people's perceptions just through doing something that I loved, which was event management. Okay. I I can actually picture you as an event manager. Yeah. um, Pointing, directing. That's it, yeah. You know, Stacey, Stacey, why is it this done? Or, (laughs) you know, I can actually picture you actually being quite a good event manager. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so with the diversity, the card sort mm. of thing, so how how did that come about? Yeah. What was it? Uh, and, and where is that at this moment in time? Yeah, I know. Yeah. So it's essentially like a discount platform for disabled people because when you live with a conditional impairment, on average, life can cost you a lot more. So that's about £583 a yeah. month. I remember you saying that, that first it's talk. A huge when I heard amount of thought, money. Wow, yeah, yeah, like that's after paying your rent, your mortgage, your bills, your your food shopping. You know, that's, that's after all the basics. And if you think now we're living in a time where prices are going up for everything, energy, for example, um, and these are unavoidable costs. And I just thought, well hang on when you're disabled you're twice as likely to be unemployed you have to apply for 60 percent more jobs nearly half of everyone in the uk that lives in poverty is disabled and then on top of your face all these extra costs and you know i grew up um you know my parents are immigrants they've still got manual labor jobs i'm not saying that we were poor but my family you know they were just surviving really and I remember the guilt that I felt when they had to spend £7,000 on a wheelchair for me. And I just thought that could have been like the next family car and they're spending all that money on me. And for one, I couldn't understand why something such as a wheelchair was that expensive. But that's the chair that I needed in order for me to go to a mainstream secondary school. And I just thought, so that, to, that it started from then it started from me feeling guilty I was like oh my god my parents like they work so hard like my mum still works 12 hour shifts she's 60 odd now and she wants to do it I'm begging her to retire but um, 
you know, I just felt really guilty. And then growing up, I was just like, everything's so like, so much more expensive. Like, um, my travel insurance, for example, this year was about thousand pounds for the year, just because I've got a pre-existing medical condition. I've never had to claim on it, mm. but I can't. I equally can't afford not to take it out either. Whereas somebody else of a similar age to me would be like 20 quid for them. (laughs) There's just everywhere you turn, there's just so many more extra costs. So what that means is disabled people don't have the same opportunity as financial stability as everybody else. And I think that's actually a basic need because when when you're constantly worrying about money, you can... You know, it, it's difficult. You can't enjoy your life. You like, And the amount of things that I've just felt like I've had to do be, or stay in jobs that I really didn't want to because I'm like, well, ha- how do I know how many years I'm going to work for? It's things like that. And you're always, like, overcompensating. Mm. And I just thought, the government's not doing anything about it. The charities aren't doing anything about it. So why don't I try and do something about it? Um, so we're at... We're, we're not far now from launch. Honestly, Omar, I've been on such a journey. I lost all my investors when the pandemic hit and it took me ages to get them because on the topic of disability, people are very fearful as a, as a society. We are afraid we're going to say the wrong thing. We're afraid we're going to offend somebody. Even though one in five of us in the UK are disabled, it's the largest diversity strand. But as a society we just aren't there yet we don't know how to have confident conversations so can you imagine me going to pitch for investment people were just telling me no this isn't a business this should be a charity and I'm there like no it's businesses that influence society otherwise why would you have influencers and why do they make so much money and I also want to use this vehicle of entrepreneurism and and business to help other business people out there understand their responsibility in this as well like it can't just be disabled people trying to make their world more inclusive because we're not the ones that put the barriers there in the first place Mm. and you know I always say my condition doesn't disable me and I think I've proved that with all the things that I've done in my life to date but the things that disable me are inaccessible places um the way in which society society is designed, the bias that people have. So when I was 16, I really struggled to get a part-time job. I kept telling people on my covering letter that I've got a condition, but it doesn't affect my ability to do this role. I'd got to the point where I had to apply for over 100 jobs and I just heard nothing back. And I thought, what's going on here? So I did a bit of an experiment and I took that one sentence off and I got offered an interview straight away. So at the age of 16, I got a real harsh life lesson that life's going to be hard. You're going to always have to work 10 times as hard as everybody else just to be even given half of half of an opportunity. That was when you were 16, roughly, yeah. let's say roughly about 20 years ago. Yeah. Do you think the world and businesses have moved on much from there? I, I think a little bit, but not a lot. And yeah. it's really sad. And what I'm really seeing in this space of, like, even more broadly inclusion, it's people don't understand their privilege and they don't understand what it's like to be from an oppressed or a marginalised community or group of people. And especially disability, you know, it's so... It's such a diverse community in itself. If you've met one disabled people, you uh, if you've met one disabled person, you've only met one disabled person. You know, there's 14 million of us in the UK. People get stuck on approaches, you know, to disability inclusion, and that's understandable. But but I think you know, there's so many experts out there that can help. But no, sadly, Omar, I I don't think much has changed and. I think that's why I became an entrepreneur because I just felt that I couldn't rely on other people to give me opportunities. It it wasn't really serving me, you know. I I only went to university because I felt like I had to have a degree to fall back on. Um, So, yeah, a lot of the things that I've done in my life aren't because I've wanted to. It's because I felt I've had to just to survive. And I don't think anyone should have to live like that. 
You know the first job. So what was the first job that you had? <laughs> My first job was in a call center. I was selling photography packages. Okay. <laughs> I was awful at it. <laughs> But it was brilliant, like, I got my foot in the door, I had my first interview. Um, how did um, the employer, or, you know, your early employees, yeah. how did employers, how did they kind of react? Because I'm, yeah. I'm sure, I, uh, not making excuses mm. for them or anything, but sometimes there is that little bit of a fear, mm. like, what do I say? Yeah. Or Because obviously what people will look, yeah, that's just naturally people kind of look, and, and, and like you said, you're... you're Mm. your height is a head turner because people will be like yeah. you know but how did early on businesses take to obviously having a disabled employee like yourself well that was the reason why <laughs> I put it in my covering letter because I thought as soon as people see me that's what they're gonna Focus notice on, about yeah. me so why don't I just be the person to address it not you know being a bit naive I guess at the time not realising it wouldn't go in my favour Um. so now yeah it's some people treat it like the elephant in the room because in some, you know, circumstances, especially in interviews, people can't really ask you about your health and things like that. So um, what I do is I would use the interview opportunity to say, and if I am successful in this role, these are the adjustments that I would need. But I'd be doing that to put them at ease. Not not, not for my yeah. benefit. But I know that that's the way in which I have to operate in this society. And this is so ironic, Oma, but I'm the one that lives with my condition, the pain of it and the inconvenience of it, but I'm always having to think about everybody else because I know that people react awkwardly to me. How ironic is that? Mm, scary, isn't it? It yeah. is. It's, I suppose, look, not not the same level, mm. but <clears throat> being a Muslim, sometimes... Yeah. Um, but I, when I wanted to go and pray yeah. in the, in, you know, at work... And I'm thinking, okay, it shouldn't be difficult for me to ask for a prayer room. Mm. It shouldn't be difficult for me to, you know, do the ablution beforehand sort of stuff. But you are, you're right, you're thinking of what other people will think or how am I going to make it awkward for them or, you know, make sure that no one walks across. Or if someone is going to walk across, I've blocked everything off. Mm. It is, I don't know, it's just, it's weird, isn't Mm. it? That's just the way how society pans out. Yeah. Yeah. What sort of, you know, just generally, not so not just about yourself yeah. and condition, but generally, where do you think businesses mainly struggle around, A, having conversations mm. about it, and B, making those reasonable adjustments? Do you, do you find it, <clears throat> if people have the choice to shy away from it, or is it lip service, or do you actually find actually people do genuinely value and do, do as much as they can to make those adjustments? I think it depends on the confidence of the employer and the culture of the workplace. Um, what about resources? Yeah, it's, it's a really good question. And I think yeah. there's this big um, myth that providing adjustments is going to be really costly and things like that. But many adjustments that people need don't cost much, mm. if anything at all. It might be just flexible working, it might be a car parking space, it might be um, a change of targets, for example. But there's also government schemes out there. So the one that I really wanted to share with everybody today is called Access to Work. And what that it scheme does, it's open to anybody who lives with a condition or an impairment, and it will help you meet the cost of your adjustments. So actually, there's no reason for employers to say, we can't afford to take this person on. Yeah. Um, I, I, I think it comes down to the fact that disability isn't well socialised in society. When you when you put your TV on, how much positive disability representation do you have? Like Only the other day I had to commentate in the press whether Disney should remake the, the Snow, White, uh, Snow White and the Seven Dwarves. We're, ha- we're still having those kind of conversations about disability. We're still living in a society where people don't understand what the consequences of only having that type of representation is. Like, I I featured in a LinkedIn campaign um, in 2019, and I got trolled really hard online and people were like why don't you go and get a job in Willy Wonka's chocolate factory oh I saw a job for you on the wall for like this is really so this is how powerful representation is 
people will see those films and then say these things to people like me and like I've had so many instances when I'm walking in the street people take photos of me and videos of me it's it, it's essentially a hate crime it, it's a form of harassment and I didn't know that initially mm. until I looked it up I was like I don't like this why are people doing this to me but and then if we don't have disabled people in the workplace, not only are we missing out on great talent, you know, going back to, you know, to me as an event manager, my manager was like, you're amazing. Why are you so good at this? And then I pointed out to them, I was like, well, this is what I do every day anyway. Um, so I think it's a real shame that employers, you know, are really missing out on talent. And I just think there's a lot of fear, but, you know, it, it's not that difficult and I, I just think we can't use use excuses anymore and you know finally it's it's a legal obligation you know we've got the Equality Act uh, to, to 2010 so not only is it a, the morally the right thing to do legally it is your duty as well to to employ disabled people you are amazing your that your manager at the event manager was was right uh, definitely in in that sense um we're just going to take a short break guys you're listening to the business hour with uh, umar rashid we have today uh, shani danda on today um we're just going to take a short break and join us after that welcome back to the business hour here on unity fm i'm umar rashid and we have today with us the amazing shani danda so the first part of the show we talked about how shani grew um, she was born with a very rare condition how she went through life through ma- mainstream school um, how she then had to apply way more um, than let's say the normal person I say normal person in inverted commas um, to get those opportunities you know the sad thing I was thinking about that is we, you know yes that was 20 years ago mm. we still hear similar sort of stories now where um, you hear the story about you know someone with an ethnic background name, yeah. uh, and and if they change their name to, let's say a, a Western name, yeah. Dave, for yeah. example, you know Dave gets an interview straight away. Yeah. Sort of stuff. So those sort of biases and discrimination is is still there. Um, I love that I found out that you you've got a degree and you was in event management, and I can definitely see <laughs> you being an amazing uh, event management. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, baby. <laughs> But I think in a really, really good way. And I yeah. think you'd be in an amazing job, sort of, stuff, um, a manager as well, boss as well. Um, we, we then kind of looked, just before the break, we touched on a bit about your experiences at work and, yeah. and reasonable adjustments and, and everything like that. Um, have you, have is it fair to say you've worked with, with big corporates, but have you worked with SMEs as well or experienced with SMEs as well? Yeah, yeah so, so. I, I spend a lot of my time working with businesses and brands to help them become more inclusive for their disabled customers and employees. And that's been across all sectors, all business types, absolutely. And I think as well, there's a lot of smaller businesses out there that think you need a lot of money to do mm. this, but that's not the case at all. First of all, you need the right intention. And you need to understand that there are lots of things that you can do that don't have to cost the earth. Yeah, no, definitely, definitely. And I think you're, you, one thing I did like you mentioned before, and I think being in HR, you know, we relate to reasonable adjustments. Yeah. And, and I think there is that myth around actually reasonable adjustments it's going to cost too much and mm. especially the classic okay we haven't got a lift does that mean we have to now change the whole building mm. we've got to get the architects in or whatever well no sometimes yeah. you can just you know yeah. make adjustments you know the person can work yeah. on the ground floor doesn't always have to be upstairs mm. um, what I want to speak to you about in the workplace mm. is over time with the emergence of let's say technology yeah. has 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 workplaces now become a bit more disabled friendly if that's the correct mm. word to use or the terminology to mm. use sort of thing do you feel that with technology that it has become a bit more of a more inclusive or a bit more better place for 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 people what i think's been the biggest transformation in making workplaces more disability inclusive was the pandemic yeah the reason i say that is because pre pandemic there was this big you know um idea that if people worked from home they weren't doing their work they were just putting their feet up watching tv Chilling. you know doing their washing or whatever and there are so many disabled people that ask for that adjustment to say look can i work from home 
and they'd just get a blanket statement saying no you know if we do it for you then we're gonna have to do it for everybody else again that's terrible because when you ask for a reasonable adjustment it's not a perk what you're doing is you're helping to level the playing field Mm. so the pandemic was huge because suddenly it opened everybody's eyes not only to in to inequality but it showed what was possible yep <clears throat> and it's sad that it had to take a pandemic to d- for people to do that but now it means that we can all work not only disabled people but we can all work now much more you know flexibly depending on what your job is in a way that suits you and employers have learned that you know you can trust your employees and people can work remotely so i think sadly it was the pandemic that was this big shift in in mindset but yeah technology does help but then there are also a lot of people that will only ever go so far so what have deaf people been doing in working from home and joining zoom meeting after zoom meeting after zoom meeting for example you know have their needs been met are their employees asking them what they can do to make this all more accessible so it's really hard to just apply a blanket approach and get it accessible for everybody because we're all individual and what might be good for one person might not be good for the next person so that's why you know i also have a lot of people ask me well what's reasonable what do you what's reasonable Mm. in reasonable adjustments and that again all comes down to the top the nature of your business individual yeah, yeah and the individual and it t- has to take into account you know the environment the job and everything so there's no like blanket way to just say this is reasonable and this isn't um but what i always say is out of the 14 million disabled people only about 20 percent of people were actually born with their conditions so that means 80 percent of disabled people throughout their life have acquired their condition Mm. so the chances are that disability will affect you whether that's directly or within the workplace or it might be a loved one and if that was you if you went on to acquire a condition or an impairment how would you want to be treated wouldn't you want to be treated with respect and Mm. with dignity wouldn't you want an opportunity to continue working and it's, it's so sad, Armand, but there are people that will never get the opportunity just because they have a condition. And that's not okay. Do you still find, <clears throat> in your experience, have you come across when someone has acquired a disability, mm. the workplace changes? The, and what I mean by that is their attitude towards that person is more negative and sometimes the default state is, okay, let's see how we can effectively dismiss and get get rid rid of of them them. yeah it's really sad but i've I've heard that i've had people say that to me i've had employees where that has happened to them as well um and again another really interesting fact about disability is is 70 percent of disabled people live with non-visible conditions or impairments i think when people think about disability all they think about is ramps and wheelchairs but there's only about 1.2 1.2 million wheelchair users in the UK so it is a very small minority um, but yeah absolutely and what I would say is we've got the Equality Act but sometimes that's really hard to prove disability discrimination as well um, so that's why it's really important that if you want to retain talent and, and have really you know talented people in your organization and a talented pipeline that you are inclusive and that you are considering disabled people because we've got bills to pay Mm. we need to go and do everything that everybody else does you guys need to go to dubai as well exactly yeah yeah i need to go and do all the things that everybody else does so why shouldn't i be able to have an equal chance at a job you know your friends and family sort of thing um do you still find them now still tiptoeing around your disability or has it got to a stage where actually you know what they they just see actually shani is no different to us shardy is literally like us or yeah. even better than us or you know how do you still find those experiences so i remember being of the age around like 16 to 20 that was a really difficult age because 
I had stopped breaking my bones finally. And for me, I felt like that's when my life really started. And um, I was very infantilized though at that age. Like my family was still treating me like a child. Like it was, it was a massive deal that I wanted to go on the bus to college. Like, they're like oh my God, what if you break your leg on the bus? I was like, well, I've broken my leg on the bus, you know. I'm not going to just stay at home and think, what if, what if, what if. I need to live my life. Um, so that was tough. They, I felt very infantilized. And, you know, I was a young woman at that age and people would still treat me like a 12-year-old. I would love to sit here and say, you know what, yeah, everyone's cool and everyone's like, yeah, Shani, you're fine or whatever. But there's one topic where people do not treat me the same and that's on the topic of marriage. Mm. So I've got an older sister and I've got a younger brother. And, uh, you know, in, in South Asian communities, everybody only ever talks about people's weddings, don't they? Like it's the be all and end all. And look, no offence to people that really believe that that is a real big thing to do in your life like I totally respect that but personally for me and for many other people that I know like marriage isn't my only definition of success there are so many other factors um so yeah as soon as my older sister got married you know people started then talking about my younger brother's wedding and he was like 10 at this age when my older sister got married and I was like well what about me I'm the next child and people like just looked at me. They, they were, they were just shocked. So, um, <laughs> I think when you live with a condition or an impairment, people assume you don't have the same needs and desires as everybody else. And it, yeah, it was ironic again because like I'd grown up in a family, and they're like, "There's nothing you can't do." You know, there's, you can go out there and do everything, but then something so intrinsic to our culture I, I was never included in and even now oh my I'm 34 years old my parents have never hassled me to get married and on one hand I'm really glad but then on the other hand I'm really annoyed I'm like why are you not talking to me about this and then when I once mentioned like well why aren't you what about me it was just so awkward and I just thought I can't deal with the burden of everything that they feel and me having to deal with my feelings at the same so I was just like no nah, not today so that's the only one thing oh my that I would say yeah okay yeah. you don't like through I know people listening mm. won't be able to see you mm. but you know the way you talk and everything, you've got such a like a smile on your face yeah I can see that positive bubbly energy sort of thing and I know, without a doubt, growing up with the condition that you have, you, you know, it's been, it would be, it's difficult, it's probably, it's been difficult, it probably will remain difficult yeah. sort of thing. But how do you and, 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 and other people with disabilities that you probably know of, mm. how, how do you manage to stay as positive as much as you can? Um, that's a really good question, actually. So I see my condition as just another feature of me, just like I've got brown hair and I've got brown eyes. And I've also got this condition. Yeah. So you know how other people l might think of disability? Like, I don't wake up every morning and, and be like, oh my God, I'm three foot ten, or oh my God, I'm this, or I'm in pain. Like, you just live with it. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> it's just another feature. It's just another characteristic. And yes, of course, there are bad days. Like, I'm literally in pain every single day because not only do I have this condition, I have, I've developed loads of others as well. Um, but I, I just feel like I was given two choices. I could either let my condition define me in a really negative way or I could just make, you know, make good of the cards that I've been dealt with in life and I could define my life in a way that I wanted to and in a positive way. And I a lot of a lot of what I do now in my work whether that's me working as a consultant with businesses whether that's me being an entrepreneur whether that's me um doing something in the press or on tv it's all linked back to my purpose mm. which is trying to make this world that we live in fairer for everybody especially people in the south in the south asian community because I don't think disability has moved anywhere in our community and that makes me sad that nothing's changed in my lifetime so how do you think that can be changed 
I think definitely through education. Um, you know, I, I for me, like I educate a lot of people, and for me, that definitely started in my own home. See, you know, social, you know, you, you know, recently with the whole, uh, I forgot the guy's name, the, you know, the, the cricketer Rafiq yeah. in Yorkshire. So we, it's it's all commonly known, that, you know, the racism that he yeah. experienced, and and this is what's always got me thinking because people say, oh, it's lack of education, lack of education, lack of education. People need to be educated, and there's me thinking, well, cricket generally is seen as an an educated sport yeah. that the people who play have gone to, you know, private school. They're generally educated, yet these are the people who, <coughs> through whether it's banter or not. Mm are quite the worst offenders so yeah. and I think I look at still the Asian community mm. um, I, I would say my relatives mm. me myself I've been educated to a certain way but we still have biases I sometimes yeah. do show biases towards yeah. certain people sort of thing so when you say education mm. I'm challenging you on a little bit of that because I think actually you know what I don't think it's education about people education about <coughs> um you know, um, conditions sort mm. of thing. I think it's it's just a cultural thing and the biases that you have, and I think it's trying to challenge those biases as much as you can. Yeah. Or I think it's having role models like yourself because I think that's the best education because the myth and the biases that we mm. have in our head is people with conditions, mm. they, they, we, we, we put them down we've at the bottom. We've got to keep them at home. Yeah, we've yeah. got to protect them that yeah. we need protected. Yeah, yeah. And I think the more... The best education for me is people like yourself mm. who can go out there and show, mm. actually. But then equally, why is it my job to do that? I, you know what, Omar? Yeah. I always think, <clears throat> what if I didn't do this? Like, you know, I've, I've spoken, I was an event manager for 10 years. There's a reason I'm not still doing that job is because I can't let this inequality carry and I have to be part of this. But that's not fair to me. Mm. What if I wanted to do something else? I, I don't know. So what I'm saying is we need non-disabled people to recognise this and be allies as well. It can't right. just be disabled people doing something here and doing something there and being told that we're really big inspirations. I think I agree with everything you said. We definitely need more than education. But if we think about, let's just say from a cultural perspective in, in our communities... I've had people say to me because I'm sick, oh, you did something bad in your past life, that's why you're disabled. Like, that's an awful thing to say. Like, I know there are people that will say it's a punishment from God or a reward from God, and that's that's their opinion. And then there's cultural issues, like that person's seen as vulnerable, therefore their family won't let them go out, go to work, go and socialise in communities because they're scared that someone will take advantage of that person as well. But, you know... We live in a country where there are lots of services, there are lots of support services, and I think we have to work hand in hand in, with those things because keeping somebody at home just because you're fearful mm. is not going to be any good for them, is it? And why don't why can't they have a chance at living a, a fulfilling and worthy life? I I remember people in my family said that to me. Oh, you don't have to work, do you? You can just claim benefits. I was horrified. I was like, what am I going to do? Just sitting at home all day? Like, I want to contribute to society. Um, and, and ironically, like, people had such low expectations of me, but I think I've achieved the most. <laughs> when I look around, like, especially in my family circle, my cousins and things like that. So, I, you know, it just goes to show who empower people. I'm just thinking, hopefully your cousins aren't listening <laughs> to the show. No. <laughs> if you empower people and enable people in certain ways then only good things can happen and and for me Omar it's about removing barriers so whether you um are a restaurant owner or whether you have a news agent or whether you have a big business what would be brilliant is if you're thinking of ways to always remove barriers so let's say you own a premises like does it have the basic wheelchair access yeah does it have it was, access yeah, yeah. Because if not, I'm not going to probably want to come to your establishment, am I? For example. Yeah, no, 100% agree. But, and that's why, you know, you're here to kind of share um, share your expertise. You, you, 
you recently have you work with a lot of businesses mm. like you said you're a consultant you you know you're, you're like a diversity disability specialist and a lot of businesses will come to you and say look Shani help us you know yeah. we want to be better but do you still find some businesses that come and you see as it's a bit token gesture it's yeah. a bit like okay it's it's flavor of the month mm. or actually if we do it we get good press for it and it's good marketing for us and people will love us but yeah. it's it's do you know what i mean do yeah. you do you still feel that or do you yeah. think there is an element of that no i i think so and and sadly it's a bit of a double edged sword as well isn't it because like i know loads of people and they're like oh they're just putting me on the front cover of their brochure and they always ask me but then equally i'm like but if they don't do that how are they going to attract more people like you so that's what i mean when i say it is a double edged yeah. sword um so yeah but it, but for me it's not always about these big gestures and billboards and marketing it's a, it comes down to the small actions that you have as well like how inclusive are your job adverts how good are you are making reasonable adjustments how fair are your policies those are the things that really will mean the most to me and your employees, you know. Um, and people can see when it's tokenism yeah. easily. So nobody's fooling anybody. And, you know, there's, there's sites out there like Glassdoor. It all will come out. I'm scared to read sometimes <laughs> Glassdoor. Cause right? I, I am scared because some of our clients, y you're having that conversation yeah. with them, but it's it's like... You, you're just talking to a brick wall yeah. and it's like you're not going to change that mindset and, and the, the difficulty is then how do you step away or because something bad happens you, yeah. you kind of actually reach it I'm just conscious of time so quickly I want to speak to you look you was on EastEnders I was how did that come about <laughs> how did that opportunity come about oh okay I'm a massive 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 EastEnders fan like, I've watched it since Peggy Mitchell and Grant Mitchell. Literally, like my earliest yeah. memories of my childhood include East Sunders. And I'm, I, um, I have an agent now and I'm not an actress, I have to say. And they said, oh, do you want to do go on audition for this opportunity? Because they knew I loved East Sunders. I was like, yeah, but I didn't think I had a chance in getting the part at all. I just wanted to go, you know, just wanted to be a part of it. Just wanted to go hang out in Albert Square. So anyway, I went, I did the audition. They called, then they called me back to do it again. And I, I got the part. It was only a very small part, but it was with lines. It was in a big storyline as well. Um, and my mom actually said to me, she goes, do you know when you were younger, you said that you wanted to be in EastEnders? I was like, no way. Uh, so that's how that came about. What was EastEnders is... Um motive i'm not and i don't say mm. that to belittle any skills so, that you have or anything yeah. but was, was was did they have a was that part of a plan to say look we want to promote or recognize or yeah. highlight you know so disabilities the, the brief wasn't just for disabled um actors or anything like that it was just an open it was just an open brief it didn't say you know we want a person that's this or looks like this and I think that's where it works best, right? I don't, yeah. I don't want to always be looking at what boxes I can fit into. And I, I have had people say to me, you know, oh, you only got that job because you're disabled, or oh, you only got that because they don't have any disabled people. Yeah. And it, it really hurts. Like, of course, you don't want to be a token hire. Um, but when, when people constantly think that of you, it's really like undermining as well. Yeah. So much so that I went to work the next day and I asked my manager I was like why did you hire me that's how insecure it made me feel I was a lot younger in my career at this point and I was like because someone in my family said this and they were horrified they were like someone that knows you in your family said this about you and they were just like well no you're qualified we love your personality and you get the job done that's why we've hired you and I was like oh, okay then <laughs> <laughs> so yeah it, it really does um it really can affect your confidence you know things like that but no, I'm glad to say the EastEnders thing is just, uh, I don't know, they just liked me, I guess. <laughs> wicked, wicked. Um, you've been on a lot of other TV as well. Yeah. Um, it's daytime TV shows, I can't even read them off <laughs> because I don't even know. So, Loose Swimming is one. Loose Swimming, uh, I've been on This Morning. And then I also review the day's news on uh, Jeremy Vine and Channel 5 as well. Okay, yeah. okay. How, how do you feel? I mean, and, and, and do, do you, 
because I think I've seen clips where obviously you are talking about your history, you are mm. talking about your condition, you are mm. talking about your experiences, sort of thing. Do you feel like you are a role model for for let's say the disabled community? Uh, is that your intention, or is it just inadvertently that you've become, let's say, a voice? And yeah, I I want to start by answering this question by saying. I never had any ambition to be on TV. I, you know, I never, apart from obviously being in EastEnders. EastEnders yeah. um, I you know I still pinch myself at the fact that I have these opportunities. That I've been able to do all the things that I have, but it's because I want to be part of the changes that I want to see. Growing up, I never saw any disabled people on TV. Growing up, despite being in a big South Asian community, I didn't know any of the disabled people. Mm. It was so lonely. You know, obviously my family were really supportive, but. You can't really understand what someone's going through unless you've been in a similar situation yourself. And, um, you know, everything I do is to create change. So I see these opportunities as uh, opportunities for me to take up that space. And I've gone into it thinking, yeah, I'm representing disabled people. But you should see the feedback I get. It's from all different types of people, including non-disabled people. So I'm really proud to just take up space for people that just don't have a voice, that don't feel um, heard or seen. It goes beyond disability, so I'm, I'm really proud of that. You should be. You should be. Shani, massive, massive thank you for coming on today. Thank You've you. been amazing, really, really insightful. Um, I've learned a lot. I've enjoyed it. I hope the listeners have enjoyed it as well. Maybe when you're, maybe when you're a recurring star on <laughs> EastEnders maybe you'd like to come back then as well absolutely yeah. thanks for having me brilliant thank you very much guys you've been listening to the business hour here with Umar Rashid on Unity FM we've just had Shani Danda on the show if you just caught the back end of the show and you'd like to listen more um, we will be replaying this show again on Saturday at 5 o'clock alternatively you can go on my YouTube channel at Umar Rashid HR and listen to the show again as well as other previous episodes um, please also reach out connect with me on other social media platforms such as LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram and um, the handle for all of those are at Umar Rashid HR. Please connect with me, give me feedback on the show, on our guests even if you like to attend um, or like to be on the show, um, then reach out and we can see if we can make that happen. Um, until next week, please do tune in again next Tuesday, 6 o'clock. Until then stay safe and thank you for listening. Slow and come.